Welcome to the last session of our conference. It gives me great pleasure today to welcome uh, Thomas K. Nielsen. He is Associate Professor from Aalborg University in Denmark and has previously written about the history and the memory of the Northern Crusades, Henry of Livonia, the coming of Christianity, and the making of the cultural landscape of the medieval Baltic. He has recently started research on the history of emotions, as he wants to capture the difference in the description of German, Danish, and local actors during the Northern Crusades. Today he wants to present this paper, Emotions and Sensations in the 13th Century Baltic Crusades. Thank you. Thank you, mm -hmm. Stefan, and thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. uh, and as is sometimes a rule uh, when giving papers, I have to start with a disclaimer, <laughs> or, or several disclaimers, actually. Um, because, and I, and I like to see in the, in, in the, uh, the program that, that Anil and I are sort of the odd ones out. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm afraid that what I'm going to say is, is, is even more sort of out of, uh, out of the, uh, the theme of the conference and, and um, uh, even also the theme of the session. But well, let's see. And, and please uh, apologize and bear with me. Uh, because, and I have to say uh, from the outset that this uh, paper, in a sense, is um, written uh, on uh, on inspiration from some of my students, who are uh, these years very much into emotional history, uh, Barbara Rosenwein style, um, and to a sense that I had to sort of read into so that as well. Uh, so, so what you're going to hear today is uh, something a bit different, uh, a different kind of history, if I may, uh, than what we've perhaps uh, heard um, earlier on. And if this is not enough, there's another disclaimer coming on, because as Stephen just said, I wanted originally to look into how different groups in the Baltic were depicted uh, concerning their relations, concerning their emotions and sensations that they might have felt or, uh, or uh, talked about or expressed or performed or whatever. Uh, and for this purpose, I wanted to look into, of course, Henry Livonia's Chronicle, which I've dealt with before. But <laughs> when reading Henry again, it soon dawned upon me that uh, this annoying German chronicler He's not overly vocal on people's emotions or sensations. He needs, uh, and I, I really like the narrative, of course. It's a wonderful detailed narrative. And as you all know, there are plenty of historical figures whose individual emotion, emotional outbursts, perhaps, or sensorial experiences that Henry, had he done what I hoped, because it's been a while since I read him last time, uh, that he could easily have it pounded on, but he didn't, because clearly this was not his method. Rather, his narrative is filled with notions of collective stuff, emotions, if I may, and these are very general and abstract, if ever at all related. In his narrative, the Regent Church as a collective may, as you know when you read it, uh, be beset with tribulations, as he called it, while the people of, uh, of, of the same area occasionally rejoice, Gauden in Latin, over victory or grieve, luctum habibat, uh, over their losses. And only very rarely and never directly does the chronicler relate how such rejoicing was performed or staged, let alone how such rejoicing, or its opposite, the, the, uh, the tribulations, felt to the people involved. So we are in no position to learn what feelings these situations aroused. As I think you noted yesterday, we don't know how people felt or thought about things, but I'm going to try to, to uh, I, I can't prove anything, of course, but I'm going to look into some of it uh, either way. Um, so we are now in no position to learn what feelings these situations aroused, who were to put who were even to be counted among the people, uh, the collective noun, the Regan Church, 
sometimes seem to include only the people living, uh, residing in Riga, but other times the concept uh, includes the entire population of Christians under perhaps the authority of the Bishop of Riga. Uh, one example, at a certain victory, uh, the rejoicing was accompanied by music. These, uh, this is a, uh, an instance that I'm sure you all uh, are aware of. As when a priest, perhaps, and probably the chronicle himself, mounted the ramparts, playing sharp sounds on his string instrument, which caused you know, people to either stop, please stop with that noise because it's <laughs> killing us, or whatever. <laughs> Uh, well, these, and, and you would have some other instances in which you could uh, argue that here is a, um, an example of people exp expressing emotions. Uh, we have a, a commander of a, of a castle crying out loud when he's seeing, uh, when he's seeing, I think it's a Russian, Auntie will know, um, when he's seeing that, that his castle is burned down. Uh, but when we read Henry, he puts a Christian uh, text into the mouth of this, uh, of this uh, pagan. So that doesn't really work. All of this has forced me away from Henry of Livonia's Chronicle in this connection, I'm sorry for that. And unfortunately, this also means that I will not be able to relate much on the topic for the session, as I just stated, or indeed the entire conference. Only very little of what I shall say in this paper will have something directly to do with Danish Estonian relations. So I'll, I'll pause for a few seconds if everybody wants to leave. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, well, I'm obviously sorry for this and I hope you'll forgive me for, for taking us to another uh, yet still Baltic location, namely Prussia and Pomerania in my talk today. So it's my hope that what I have to say today may also be applicable to other regions targeted by the Baltic Sea. I shall start by telling of a miraculous discovery of a precious relic in Prussia. And I shall end on a more theoretical note when trying to understand what this story may all be about. So please bear with me. On the daybreak of St. Barbara's Day, the 4th of December 1242, a band of brothers from the Teutonic Order of Prussia, in a covert action, scaled the walls of the castle of Satovici in present-day Poland. A few hours later, around 10 a.m., God gave the five knights, the five Teutonic knights, and their 24 armed men a solid victory over the 50 warriors that had been guarding the stronghold belonging to Santa Berg, the Duke of Pomerania. The story of this battle, and I shall retell it in more detail shortly, comes from the Chronica Tare Prusche, the Chronicle of Prussia, written between 1326 and 1331 by Peter of Duisburg, a priest from the lowlands near Arnhem and active in the uh, Teutonic Order. Peter's chronicle recounts the history of the Teutonic Knights in Prussia through the many wars with the pagan population and some other Christian enemies of the time. Shortly after Peter's completion of his work, a chaplain of the Teutonic Order, Nicholas of Joachim, reorganized and translated Peter's original Latin into Middle High German verses. Let's get back to the battle. Even if on the face of it, this battle seems quite ordinary, you know, the useless stuff, Teutonic Knights, meeting foes, defeating them heroically. There's still a hint of something extraordinary with this battle in Peter of Duisburg's text. The battle is more finely detailed in the narrative. We learn that the band of Teutonic brothers fought manly, virilita, against particularly strong and weapon-trained men who defended themselves bravely, fortita, the Teutonic Knights were under the commander of one of, one of the command of Marshal Dietrich von Bernheim, a magnanimous man, Totus Magna, Magnanimus, who in the text is even likened to the classical heroes of Ulysses and Hector. In its military tactics, however, the fight in 1242 was a quite ordinary fight, and the end of battle also saw some very routine features. After killing the whole garrison, 
the Teutonic Knights, tied up 150 men, sorry, the men were killed. They tied up 150 women and with their children and went to search for treasure and booty. And this is where, to me at least, this story becomes particularly interesting. The soldiers did find booty, but among it was a quite unexpected and precious find. Hidden in a cellar, they came across a coffin which contained yet another small, small casket, this one made of silver. And inside this, they discovered the severed head, the skull of a maiden. They did not know who the head once belonged to, whose shoulders it had sat on, but a name tag attached to the remains of her hair and the skull in the box revealed that this was the severed head of Saint Barbara. The Teutonic Knights had discovered a precious, precious relic of Saint, a martyr of old, and they had discovered the relic even on that Saint's own name day. This was truly a miracle performed by God. According to several martyrologies, some of which date back to the 7th century, Barbara's father, a pagan named Dioscuros, at the time of Roman Emperor Maximian, that is the early 4th century, locked up Barbara in a tower before embarking on a business trip. And in her imprisonment, Barbara equipped the tower or had the trial equipped with three windows, signifying, of course, the Trinity. When declining in marriage, proposed her to her father by her father, he himself carried out the death sentence to her because she didn't want to get married with this other guy, and he decapitated her for staying true to her Christian faith. Before that, she was vehemently tortured. Uh, and uh, during her torture, miracles appeared, of course. Following her death, her father uh, also was the victim of one of those miracles because he was struck by lightning and killed. Perhaps this is because of the lightning that struck her father that St. Barbara is venerated today, especially by miners, military armorers, and other professions that deal with uh, high explosives. Everybody in that day uh, knew who St. Barbara was and they would have heard the stories connected to her death and to her martyrdom. And uh, here she is, depicted, um, uh, sorry, here she is depicted on two later paintings that also describe, of course, details from, from her martyrdom. You can see here. Lucas Cart, the other, uh, having his father, her father decapitating her, the poor soul, and, and of course uh, the tower with only one window uh, in, uh, in, uh, by the, uh, the painting of Giovanni uh, von Trappio in 1508. I stated before this uh, little story, um, and I could, I could and I should perhaps have taken another picture instead of those, uh, because in our uh, tour uh, at, the, uh, at, at the very beginning of this conference, we went to the Nicoliste, uh, where, of course, a, a very beautiful picture of St. Barbara with the tower is, is one on one of the, uh, the altar panels uh, uh, in that museum. Now, as stated before, this little story comes from Peter of Duisburg's uh, The Court of Prussia, and writing in the 1320s, Peter may have been relying on an earlier text for his narrative of the discovery of the relics of Barbara. A letter in Middelheim German, the so-called Hermann von Salsa's Bericht über die Eroberung Poisons, which is kept in the Deutschland Zentrale in Vienna, is the earliest text that refers to the discovery of Barbara's relics. Unfortunately, this is a somewhat dubious text. It pretends to be authored by Hermann von Salsa, the fourth Grand Master of the Teutonic Order that served and who, who served until 1210 to 1239. And here you can already, there's a mixed in, a mixture in, in, in dates here. Because Hermann von Salsa's dates does not fit with the date 1242 of the battle. So the text is extant, the text, uh, the, the Hermann von Salsa's Bericht, is uh, extant only in a 16th century copy from uh, 1514. It is widely agreed among scholars that uh, 
uh, that like Peter of Duisburg, also the author of this text, the Bericht, uh, Hermann von Salzer Bericht, relied on a text which is now lost. And this is also the case with the other, another <laughs> set of texts compiled into the so-called Translatio et Miracula Sancte Barbarae. This collection consists of texts that span from the late 14th century and into the 15th century, supposedly the lost text on which all of these later texts seemingly draw must have come from the conquest period, that is, at least before 1280. From this diverse textual corpus, different traditions as to why and how the relics of Barbara came to Eastern Pomerania in the first place um, may, be may be deduced. There's one tradition that holds that the relics were brought to the region by pilgrims from remote lands, as it said, who had gone to Rome for the sake of obtaining relics of the saints. Apparently, there was a lack of proper relics in the newly converted region. Another tradition in this uh, compilation of texts claims that the relics were collected in Rome by their prince, we don't know who that was, who visited Rome for spiritual consolation. And a third tradition, and I particularly like this one, uh, involves either an unnamed Danish bishop returning from Rome or a papal legate that was sent to Rome, sent to Denmark, sorry, to settle dissensions between the king of Denmark and some of the ecclesiastical prelates in this region. And it's, if we're about 12 in the middle of the 13th century, that makes somewhat sense. The text is unclear on the point whether it was a, uh, a papal legate or a Danish uh, bishop. I tend to read it as a papal legate to be honest, but well, uh, some may agree, some may disagree. Anyway, um, the bishop or the legate ship was blown off course, as we just heard, this is apparently usual in these waters, uh, by violent opposing winds. The company reached safety in the harbor of Yedansk. We've just heard how very good they are at uh, making ships work again. But in this instance, they were captured by pagans, of course, who committed the uh, bishop or the legate uh, and all of his company to servitude. You've been a bishop long enough, you have to work now. Though the Christians only um, freed themselves by selling all their goods to the pagans. And during the bargaining, the head of Barbara appeared among the parcels uh, in, uh, with, within the, uh, the bishop or the legate. This text relates further that the relics then were, were later offered to the Cistercian monastery of Olivan. And this, as you may recall, was established already in 1174, but demolished by pagans in 1224. Let's get back to, us, to our story from that December day in 1242. Upon their discovery, this, the Teutonic brothers fell face down to the ground, giving thanks to God for the discovery of such a gift, before leaving the cellar with great joy, elevating the precious relic. Now, they run into an old woman among the captives, and she yells out that the knight's victory was the work of St. Barbara herself. And when questioned, she explained that she had had a vision of St. Barbara, in which the martyr appeared to her three times dressed in traveling clothes, claiming to be on her way to attend Mass in the city of Kulm, Chelmo. Because of this, the woman, the woman explained, she was convinced that St. Barbara was instrumental in the Teutonic Order's victory and that they ought to take the relic back to Prussia, where she would be held in higher reverence than here. So now it has turned from a you know, a discovery story into a translation story. You know, they had to translate the relics from, uh, from uh, Satwitsche to Chalmo. This they did, of course, and upon entering Kulm or Chalmo, the Teutonic Orders, the Teutonic Brothers and the relic were greeted by the people and the clergy in solemn processions. Apparently they've heard the news before and they've organized a very nice greeting. Now, 
Besides being a story from a period of heavy fighting and killing in the name of religion, this is also a tale, or I argue that it's also a tale of medieval emotions, and a story perhaps of how dead things may possess the capacity to move the living, how materiality may possess agency. Nicholas's German verse version of the story comes off even more emotional than Peter's. Nicholas's emotional tale begins even before the, the, the recovery of Barbara's head. And we read here that the Teutonic Knights, upon seeing how the worship of God was in decline and how pitiful trials were inflicted on the Christian by pagan attacks, that they were incensed and eager to die in battle. Hence they decided, according to Peter of Yer, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Nicholas of Yersin, of course, to attack the castle. And still in his chronicle, or in, in his verses, upon the discovery of the relic, the knights were overwhelmed with such intense joy that it frightened them. They gave thanks to God fervently and held up the, heart, the head in pure delight, joyfully carrying it out Cellar, shedding many tears in their devotion. And the old woman who had approached the night, we learned, had been praying sealessly to St. Barbara and she felt sad when her vision now took to an end, uh, seeing that the, the, uh, the Teutonic Knights actually did what she had proposed, namely carried the, the relics to Germany. Having heard the woman's story of her vision, the knights again were overcome with joy and every one of them fell weeping to the ground, giving thanks to God and Barbara. When approaching the city of Kjellno, the knights were greeted by an orderly procession of laudable churchmen in ornately decorated ceremonial robes and carrying banners and holy objects. And Nicholas's version uh, continues with this protection, another show of emotion, if you may. All the ordinary people followed the banners out of the city in pious devotion, every last man and woman. Some were barefoot, others were dressed as penitents. Many were carrying burning candles. So the Christian troops, sorry, went out pure in heart and with great solemnity to meet the holy relic. When they were close to it, they prostrated themselves in the grass, praying out loud to the holy head. Afterwards, the relics lifted their voices in a sweet hymn and went back towards the city with the tender relic. People pushed all around and made a wondrous sound. The churchmen sang sweetly, the bells rang loudly, and the lay people sang pilgrims' hymns. And to put it simply, much joy was heard among the crowd of Christians, in which mingled a great many tears caused by the intensity of feeling. Als ihr Innerheit sie trank, as uh, uh, Nicholas states. What are we to make of this truly confusing and deafening soundscape? How are we to understand what was actually going on? To me, this is about, or well, this may be about, the historicity of emotions. And in short, my own sort of homemade, homegrown, working definition of Historical emotion draws, of course, on the work of Barbara Rosemeyer, who wrote her book, Emotional Communities, in the early Middle Ages in 2007. Seven, sorry. And I consider emotions to be bodily sensations that, for different reasons, and because of different stimuli, impulses, influences, impacts, occur in human beings, and which result in external responses. Emotions manifest themselves in physical actions, or reactions that are often comprehensible, if not always appreciated by others. Emotions are thus brief, but may easily be repeated. Uh, yeah, here, yeah, see uh, the homegrown definition here. So, however, and partly in, in, uh, I'm going over here, sorry. Parting in opposition to at least the early uh, Barbara Rosenbein, I consider emotions to be slightly different from feelings, moods, or affections. Hence, this somewhat uh, constructivist definition underlines the performativity of emotions. Emotions are always carried out. 
And in stressing performativity, I also hope not for, as we saw in that uh, quote before, some ritualistic or perhaps even mechanistic ways of expressing emotions. And with this, I wish to stress at least two nowadays seemingly banal elements that one, emotions are social in that they involve relations between the person or the group expressing and the person or the group perceiving. There's a tight connection between expression and comprehension, which brings to mind Professor Rosenbein's happy phrase and the title of her book, Emotional Communities, to signify groups of people who value or devalue the same sets of emotional expressions. And judging from this uh, quote, it seems that it was not only one person who, uh, who agreed to do like uh, this, if we believe Nicholas, at least. Um, I find it uh, very important, though, to state also that the clearly <coughs> ritualistic character and much emotional display, and it's obviously that this is you know, ritual in, in, in many ways. Uh, that does not imply that the emotions displayed are only outward displays or theater, maybe. I will argue that even highly ritualistic displays of emotions, as we just saw in that book, may in fact carry very deep inner feelings with them. The ritualistic element in emotional display does not diminish the uh, potential intensity of the feelings that are claimed in our texts. So finally, while some emotions may also appear to be strictly biological in their sensory aspects, think of goosebumps and, and shivers that you are unable to control yourself, even if, if, you, if you would like to, they are thus detached from any willful thought or deliberate action. Emotions are, however, particularly cultural in that they are highly dynamic and submitted to changes in perception, environment, notions of status, civility, power, and you can go on. What are we then to make of this story of extreme joy at the detection of a maiden's chopped off head in a box, only shortly after excessive killing? A clue is obviously given by genre, purpose and intended audience of the texts themselves. And Peter and Nicholas, who both tell the story of St. Barbara's head, they wrote in a difficult period for the Teutonic Order. They were both instructed to write by their commanders, and scholars tend to agree that the texts are intended to reinvigorate the Order's sense of identity and purpose, following, of course, the loss of Acre in 1291 and the ousting of the military orders from the Holy Land at that time. On the Prussian home front, the order in the early 14th century faced serious troubles with other Christian powers in the region, in, particularly, uh, in particular the, the citizens of Riga and the Polish king. These texts, Peter's and Nicholas's, however, argue not just the viewpoint of a religious military institution under external pressure, they also do providential history. The meaning of which is to place the Prussian lands and the Teutonic order firmly within God's overall plans for mankind. The Teutonic Knights have taken the word of Christ in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, to a new level. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, as it's stated in the, the Gospel. Peter of Duisburg tells us how in following Christ, the knights have suffered insults and deadly punishment, hunger and thirst. They have been mocked, incarcerated, stoned and cut asunder, tempted and put to death by the sword. It's really, really bad for those knights. They wandered in skins of sheep and goats, being in want, distressed, afflicted, in deserts, in mountains, in dens, in caves of the earth. Well, they've just been thrown out of the Holy Land, so there's a reason why he writes like that. And this is why the Teutonic Knights, like the old Maccabean, uh, old Maccabees from the Old Testament, uh, now wipe away the enemies of the faith with a strong hand, he reads. And Peter's outburst here 
was to establish this text neatly within contemporary crusading ideology, and we must imagine both Peter's original and Nicholas's translation to have found a spiritual use inside the order. These texts may have been read aloud and remembered, at least parts of it, by heart, uh, by, the, uh, by the, uh, the brothers. Barbara Rosenwald has argued for the necessity of reading contemporary theory when trying to understand historical uh, emotions. So we must also ask, what then were the medieval theories on emotion and action? And for this instance, I take theory to mean any normative text which might have influenced the specific emotional community that we want to understand. And of course, looking elsewhere in Peter and Nicholas's text, we find exactly such theory in the texts. Peter of Duisburg inserted into his chronicle a small treatise in his book two on the, on the physical and the spiritual weapons that were, that were to be used in this new providential warfare in the Baltic. And this part of Peter's narrative may offer some insights into the emotions and devotions that were valued by a military and religious emotional community like the Teutonic Knights. And the backbone to Peter's text here, and I'm finishing just about two minutes, uh, is St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, uh, chapter 6, in which St. Paul writes of putting on God's armor to stand against the deceits of the devil. And to Peter of Duisburg, writing in the early 14th century, God's armor is made out of the Christian set of virtues needed for salvation, and consequently he is able to equip the complete military gear used by a Teutonic knight in battle with a spiritual meaning. And I've tried to uh, combine Peter's list. He writes a small chapter on, as you can see, the physical weapon used by the, the knights, the shield, the sword, the spirit, the buckle, the breastplate, the, the bow and quiver, uh, the staff and the helmet. And he equips all of these elements with a spiritual element as well in his, in his uh, small treatise. And I've tried now, and it's not a one-to-one, -one because it doesn't really fit. There's, there's a, there's a uh, well, there are places where it doesn't fit that, that well. But, but there are some emotions that we, you can, that we can connect to uh, each of the, uh, of the physical and spiritual weapons, as you can see. Um, as it's quite obvious in the table, and this is very much a work in progress, I have to look um, into it. It's not all the spiritual and, 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 and physical weapons that go, as I just said, easily on one-to-one -one, uh, with emotions or reactions. But uh, Peter's text, both in his general theory of the physical and spiritual armor, and in his specific relation of the story to St. Barbara's head, suggests a tight relationship, an intersection of material things and human emotions. In his text, the discovery of St. Barbara's skull immediately seems to cause very specific ritual actions and some fiercely emotional displays. And in his treatise on the physical and spiritual armor, the material and the emotional are also connected. The human body in a Teutonic night seems to incorporate the protective armor. The armor becomes a part of the man. Uh, such relationships, of course, are in much Western philosophy normally marked by strict dualism in categories. Think of the opposites inherent in Kant's concepts of matter and mind, na nature versus culture, object, subject, stuff like that. In Peter and Nicholas's text, such dualisms seem to dissolve. The categorical differences between human subjects and material objects are quite hard to uphold. And when the Teutonic Knights wearing, incorporating both spiritual and physical armor, first kill and then cry happily, they appear like something like medieval cyborgs. Uh, and we might argue that the whole situation offers a hybrid configuration if we want to keep on talking theory, 
uh, which we see, in which we see human subjects taking the role as objects and displaying emotions while doing so, and material objects taking the role as agents. This is, of course, only one way of looking at a medieval text, and I'm still working to figure out what's actually going on. And I hope through the use of some light post-structuralist theory, material turn and a sense of emotion, uh, the historicity of emotions, to get closer to an understanding of the apparent versatility, its very broad spectrum of, of emotions that we see here uh, in, in the Middle Ages. Or to put it another way, I want to understand how the atrocities of war, the killing, apparently so easy, mingled with the display of deep inner feelings. Uh, and this is, of course, only a small part of the culture and crusading history inherent in a little maiden's severed head in a box in Prussia nearly 800 years ago. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? You didn't, when you quite come closer to these emotions of these uh, knights and uh, these violent people, so to speak, you don't use the contemporary poetic mm. literature, the, the poetry as a context. And I think that would be quite natural. Of course, we have uh, both old French and old. Uh, or medieval French and medieval German heroic poetry, for example, from very much the same time, yeah. uh, from the 12th and 13th centuries, uh, which are full of very, very emotional descriptions of exactly those warriors, those knights. And uh, in, the, in the Cochlear poetry, you have even more long, uh, shall we say, discussions about the different emotions. I think that would give a really interesting context. Yeah, sure. But you didn't mention this here. I think no, I, I haven't read into into it all yet. So this is that would be, you have fantastic material there because they will really discuss the emotions, and it, these are stories about warriors, about knights yeah. fighting. Exactly. Yeah. There's a, there's a whole culture in chivalric culture as well. Yeah, but so, for example, the, the medieval the German Die Plage, I mean, it, it's only about emotions, but it is, uh, it, it, it is about all these great warriors. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to bit. And another source I think you should could be interesting is the religious uh, literature, the homiletic literature, for example. I know the, the Scandinavian literature, the Norwegian homily book, for example, yeah. the Icelandic homily book from about 1200. Uh, then we have really also more chapters about, about grief, for example, about different kinds of love, about, and then you have discussions about what this is, what the emotion this is, and uh, what expression it is, and also an evaluation of different kinds of emotions. So I think there we have a fantastic material. Really. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Anything else? Yeah, <laughs> Just a short note that the chronicle of Nicholas von Yeroshin is in verse. So it's a verse chronicle, and most probably the idea of, of um, to, to, the word, to talk with the, this high noble group of people uh, in their own type of literature language. So that's, that's why it's in verse and in, in German. That you have even sprung a reason, I think, to, to bring and, in and this. And that's, that's, that's partly why I'm actually a bit sorry about having to, to give you the, uh, uh, or having chosen to, to offer the English translation, because as you can see, the verses are not long, longer there. Uh, and, and Mary Fisher, in her, in her translation, which I, I really like to read, but uh, she cuts the verses, and I think, of course, I've looked into especially this, uh, this, uh, this part. Uh, and I think she has a tendency to, you know, in her English, to perhaps even over-dramatize it. Uh, but if I had to do it the other way around, I wouldn't have been here today, but I, 
and I, I did this only like two days ago. So, so, um, but going on with this, I of course have to skip her translation and go directly to the to the middle high German. That's for sure. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, how common are the, the descriptions of the episodes like that in, in the other chronicles? Is this unique or is this a uh, very sort of common uh, way of describing rejoicing while finding? Uh, well, maybe it's just for the lake and not actually describing real emotions? I don't know. Exactly, we have that, that problem all the time. What is it actually describing? Um, and, and I was looking for, uh, because it had been a, a year or two since I read Henry the last time, so, and, I, and that was for another purpose. So I read Henry again and said, oh, there's nothing really here. There's nothing, you know, he's, he's, he's not even formulaic, he's just stating, oh, we, we rejoiced and then off to something else. Uh, so, so he's not of much help in that sense, and which, that was what I hoped to do. Um, so I had to change plans and revisit uh, this one. Uh, and I, I think I said in my paper sometimes that, that uh, the, uh, the description of, of, of the discovery of the relic is what gives an extra intensity to this particular uh, battle. Because otherwise, Peter Duisburg is also tedious, like Henry is. You know, there's, there's one battle, and we won that, then let's go on to the next one and win that as well. So, but here, something else happens, which, of course, makes me lose. So that's unique. That's unique, in a, in a way. Yeah, but then, as I look further into it and arrest some of the scholarship around it, it turns out that, oh, they had this from another text, uh, and this text is now lost. Uh, so, of course, this is... This is not a prime source that tells us this is how it was. This is, this is also uh, written with the effect of causing new intentions or new intense feelings in the people that read it, not just a display of what they felt who discovered. So, so it's you know, an ongoing teasing of, 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 of feelings, I think, because they needed that. As a, as a part of the armor, if I may. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I have always found these emotions extremely difficult to work with because what do we get? We get a description. Uh, and if you see Jerusalem, you cry. Everybody knows that. If you kill these <laughs> people, you are happy. Uh, <laughs> so, so what? I mean, uh, it describes what you are supposed to do in certain situations, and, and that's that's very very good to know that. Uh, but but two things: uh, where do we get to the point where they discuss uh, that you uh, are better, you become more brave, you become better in killing if you really are angry? Uh, and uh, this is the beginning, but maybe there would be other kind of uh, <coughs> theoretical literature. Uh, from the period, and that would probably also very much be theological uh, treatises about uh, yeah, mm. the era day uh, and the, I mean, all, all the, all the uh, theological feelings that open the senses to receiving something. Yeah. Uh, so, so, I mean, that, that's the first thing that emotions are so, so complicated. They're descriptive, and I haven't seen anybody really getting to the point where they go the other way around and say, if you get this emotion, then you work better within this or that field. Yeah. The other thing which is it's, uh, probably impossible to do anything about is that uh, we are looking for emotional words. They are angry, they are happy. Uh, but uh, there must also be a code of conduct that we may not know. Uh, so I think uh, Henry of Livonia functions so fantastic well because uh, he doesn't say anything about the books. He just kill and kill and kill. <laughs> and then they continue. And that is, I mean, a very strong uh, expression of emotion. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, they're good guys because they don't, they don't cry, they don't show any emotions. Uh, he, he, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that uh, we could all imagine that this is not how it was, neither is Henry's. 
Yeah, they got us. But they, 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 uh, yeah, they, 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 and Barbara Rosenwald herself has recently looked into and tried to develop a meth method of, of dealing with the works. And I, this is one of the next that I still need to, to, to read upon. Uh, so, but then there she, she uh, uh, argues with registers of uh, emotional uh, uh, words. And, but it, it seems to me, I've only read this article once, and it seems to me that her method is not that strong, actually. It's, it all, all turns down to the individual scholar doing the research. So, so it's, it's, it's difficult. And I, and I agree there's a number of, of methodo methodological um, issues at play in this. Yeah. I, think, I think, if I just make mm -hmm. it short, uh, I read Peter's treatise with this, of, of the physical and spiritual uh, the armor as a development of a knightly ethos, mm -hmm. and and in his short uh, chapters on you know the breastplate or whatever, he does uh, talk about what this what does why is this important mm -hmm. for a knight? To do. And we know of course that the the, the Teutonic knights cared so much about their their equipment and their horses and and you know that was really what kept them alive in in, in, in battle. So it, it, obviously. It, Quite important. As you mentioned, uh, likely ethos, because you almost have like a program that if you do this, then you achieve this, and so. But this is a perfect example of okay, we can achieve this. How well would they have, has this been distributed among the Teutonic Knights? How well was it read? How widespread was this program distributed among mm -hmm. the Knights? Mm -hmm. If it is a program, yeah, but obviously, it, if they it would have they would have lectures uh, mm. while in, in, in being together, uh, eating stuff, people would read out. But not in that. No, 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 no. Perhaps that is why uh, they translate it. Translate. Yes. And it has a huge discussion of for whom Peter Tuskov wrote, and and the, so there are some strong opinions about that. It was mainly addressed outside of the world yeah. uh, to to impress the world, which was striving Templars and yes. and uh, abolishing other orders. So, but so we know this, there's, this a, a there's a huge there's a huge literature that has been used inside the world. A, a, a huge, uh, you know, um, theological well, not theological, but but. Uh, uh, Religious, he's, religious literature. He's trying to impress the world that we are complicated people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and good Christians. And good Christians at the same time. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it's clearly correct to, to look at the different uh, genres, or rather different registers for different uh, contexts mm -hmm. you know, in the discussion. That's completely clear. Uh, again, a little bit more about. Uh, the context. It is problematic to look too much, I think, in modern, modern theory, uh, theoretical um, perspectives on this, because we have quite a lot from the Middle Ages, and don't forget to look at the medical treatises from the mid, uh, mid, mm. Middle Ages. I mean, Constantinus Africanus, for example, and it was a lot of discussion of what we today would see as sort of emotional problems, but discussed as medical problems. Yes. I have right. for, I have work, for example, with the idea of love sickness and those problems. And uh, today we see this as uh, emotional phenomena. Yes. But for them, it was something, uh, it was a medical problem which they meant to cure. And there we have a lot of very interesting discussion and uh, uh, really case studies too. So don't forget to check that if you want to have uh, Thank you. Contemporary context. I think we have to stop. Here. Yes. Thank so you. No, no. Thank you so much, Tom, for your interesting lecture. <laughs>